Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. I apologize for the late start. We just had a little bit of a technical difficulty and we had to restart our Facebook Live. So I hope that most of you have joined us from the first Facebook Live that was closed and restarted. Welcome to everybody. Uh, this is a special Facebook Live for our, especially for our Australian uh, viewers and my heritage users. But I see that we have users from all over the world. I see Megan from Oklahoma. I see um, users from really all over. Sue from West Virginia. Stephen from Washington State. So I guess uh, some of you are up very late. Uh, thank you for joining us despite the time difference. And for all of you Australian viewers, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a special session for you today. We'll be talking about diving deeper into Australian historical records on my heritage, a really fantastic session. Uh, before we get to that, I just wanna let you know about a giveaway that we have for today's show. We'll be giving away a My Heritage Complete Plan. That's the best plan that we have to offer on My Heritage, which includes free access to 12.5 billion historical records. All of the Australian records that Shauna will be discussing today will be included in that package, as well as unlimited family tree size, free access to all the MyHeritage photo tools, that's MyHeritage in color, and the MyHeritage photo enhancer, which are incredible, incredible tools that we have talked about at length in our Facebook Lives. So it's really an incredible plan, um, and one lucky winner will win this. So in order to win, uh, since we'll be talking about historical records today, all that you have to do is tell us about a great find that you have made in MyHeritage historical records. Something that you've discovered, whether it was just from searching um, through our, our research pages or if you received a record match um, and that uh, told you about some fantastic record about your ancestors, please do let us know. We'd love to hear those stories. And at the end of today's session, after the questions, we will be giving away a MyHeritage Complete Plan. So fantastic, fantastic prize for one lucky winner. Um, and now it's my honor to introduce our speaker for today. We have with us uh, Shauna Hicks. She's an experienced Australian genealogist and blogger. She really is quite the expert on finding your ancestors uh, and your relatives down under. So uh, let me introduce Shauna. Hi, how are you today? Hi, Esther. Lovely to be back. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Looking forward to telling people more about Australian records. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. We are we are as well. So so thank you so much. Um, and and if you'd like to just uh, share your screen now, we can we can get into it. It's not there. Uh... No, the share. Oh, there we go. Let's see if that works. We've had a, a few technical difficulties today, so we're hoping that that um, we can we can share uh, the slides seamlessly. And um, in the meantime, please do tell us where you're joining us oh, from today. Sure, no luck. Uh, there it is. Oh. Yeah. Oh. There it is. I see that. I see the Australians are now joining. We have Linda from Victoria, and Kylie says, says hi, Shauna. And okay, you should be able to see my screen now, which is digging deeper into Australian records in my heritage. Perfect. Okay, great. So in this um, next session, I'm continuing on from some of the things I discussed in the August webinar that I did on Australian records. If you missed that one on the 19th of August, um, that's the link to it there. You can go back and have a look at that because I'm not repeating some of the basic things there. This is all about digging deeper than we did in that more basic session. So if you're looking for Australia in my heritage, you have to go down to Oceania 
and where it says refine further, um, you can then dig deeper into that and it will bring up Australia, New Zealand and Samoa. There are 290 collections with nearly 90 million records in Oceania. But what I'm going to look at today is how you can trace um, some of your people using the Australian records. Now, we don't have census records like England and the US. We um, have ritually destroyed them over the years. So we use things like electoral rolls and directories to help us to try and trace people around the country. Now, Australia is a mix of seven states and territories, and you do need to know which state because they're all sort of independent. You'll have their own electoral rolls, although there are some Commonwealth rolls, but there's also state rolls. So when you're looking um, for electoral rolls, you can put in a person's name, and if it's an uncommon name, it might come up, but you may need to have a place as well. Now, this is an example with my great grandmother, who was Dorcas White. They were in Charters Towers, which is in far north Queensland. I knew that they had come down to Brisbane at some point in time. So I used the electoral rolls to narrow down that period of when they were in Charters Towers and when they were here in um, Brisbane. Now, an electoral roll basically um, will tell you where the people were living. So where I've got the top arrow is Dorcas White. She's living at Moonstone Flat, which is an area of Charters Towers. She's domestic duties, which is like housewife. And she's enrolled on the 20th of July, 1906, and she's female. It doesn't give you a lot of information, but it does tell you where they are in a particular place and an occupation. When you're looking at an electoral roll, you also need to look at who else is at that address. And if you look at the second arrow, that's Herbert William White, and that's her husband. Now, the interesting thing for me in this electoral roll was the fact that it gave the name of his mining claim, and it was number one, West Moonstone claim. With that information, I can then try and find more about them in mining records. But a lot of times that might not be in the electoral roll. It might just have occupation and minor. So it depends on how lucky you are. But that was certainly a big clue for me in the Chartist Towers role. Now, when they came down to Brisbane um, in 1934, I found Dorcas White. She's the top entry there. And she says, that she's living at Finlay's, Wilson Street, Paddington. Now, I puzzled over Finlay's for a while. I thought, was it a boarding house? Was it, you know, some place that she was living? And after a little bit, um, the light bulb went on and I realised that her daughter, Doris, had married William Finlay. So Dorcas was basically, when she filled in her electoral roll form, she just said she was living at Finlay's, which, of course, was her daughter and her son-in-law's place. Now, when I look at the other people living in Wilson Street, Paddington, there's a Herbert Cyril Salisbury, which is her son, and Ivy Florence Fern, which is her daughter. So this house is not just um, Doris and William as husband and wife. It's also got Doris's um, sister, and brother and her mother. They were all in the house together. So that was a, a good find for me. But also look at the numbers. Some of these electoral rolls only have the street. And Herbert and Ivy both said the number was 41 Wilson Street. And William Finlay said it was four. So did William make a mistake? And was Herbert and Ivy more correct? The other thing about street numbers is that over time, numbering of streets can change. So you can't um, say exactly um, that it hasn't changed. And also streets change. 
So I went looking for Wilson Street in Google Maps because I wanted to see was 41 Wilson Street still there, assuming no number change. Now, this is a useful site for anyone researching in Queensland where you find a school, a street, railway station, post office, or whatever has changed its name. If you can't find it um, in current use, you can go to this and use the, um, the finding aid and find what the street became. Now, Kerry Raymond is a personal, uh, this is her personal website, but it's free to use. And so I went into here and I looked up Wilson Street, Paddington, Brisbane, and you can see that it became Plunkett Street. It was renamed in 1938 after they'd been living there for about four years. So I knew it was Plunkett Street. I then went to Google Maps, found where it was in Plunkett Street, and you can see towards the right of the screen that the school closest to that whole area was Petrie Terrace. So by looking at electoral rolls and also then comparing them to maps, you may be able to locate the school name that any children of the couple um, that you're researching uh, went to. So don't, don't neglect uh, maps when using electoral rolls as well. Now I'm going to move on to directories. They are similar to electoral rolls, except they're not um, compiled by the government. They're published um, records, so they're not going to have everybody in them. And they usually only include women when the woman is the head of the household or is running her own business. And they don't necessarily have to be accurate because these were published year after year. My own great 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 grandfather was there um, for a long time after his death. So you take them as a, a record source and a clue, but you need to um, confirm it with other records as well. Again, you can search for a person's name or a place. And you can put the place in. You can search for keywords if you wanted to find all the people who were um, beekeepers. You could put that in and see what comes up. Now, the example that I'm using here is just a tiny little place called Clay Pans, which is out um, near Manham on the Murray River. So it's, it's a very small place, as you can see. There's no more than about 20 people there. And where I've got the arrow, there's one woman, Pearl, Pearl Bock. The rest, what you can see here, is a mix of initials. If you're searching directories, remember that it's unlikely that you're going to get a full name. It is more likely to be initials or abbreviations. You can see William there is WM, Albert is ALBT. So when you're searching, put in the full given name to start with, but if you're not having any success, try the initials, try an abbreviation, or if it's a fairly uncommon name or a small place, just put in the surname. And that way you can start to see who's in the place. And especially in a little community like this, um, everyone would have known each other. When, when you look in places that are bigger than that, this is Plimpton, what you'll get in the directories often is a street by street guide around the city. So this will help you to identify perhaps a house if there's some street numbers and that sort of thing, because it will tell you whether they're going down the west side or the north side or the east side. And then, you know, there's four houses between that and the next street. And so when you're looking at something like Google Maps, you can sort of count the houses along and you know that that's probably the building that your person might have been in. Um, so that does away with the fact that the names might have changed. The buildings probably haven't changed because there's five houses between in the two streets. So I find the street directories 
um, particularly useful in, in the larger cities. The other thing I'd point out here is if you've got an ancestor who was in a business, they may have advertised in directories. It was common for people, a bit like the telephone book, the yellow pages here in Australia, people advertised so that they would get more work. So look, look for advertisements as well. Now, government gazettes are similar um, in that they have lots of information that is collected by the government. And this includes all kinds of things. And if you've not used them, I would suggest that you just pick a year and browse some of the pages. It's really, really interesting what is in them. Now, in this particular example, I'm using keywords. So I could put in a name and see what comes up. But as an example in this talk, I'm going to use keywords. The year is 1843 and it's New South Wales. And I've used convicts. This is the year after um, the convict system stopped in New South Wales. That doesn't mean that all the convicts were suddenly free or anything like that. They continued to serve out their sentences. There were tickets of leaves and pardon and all that sort of thing still happening. But if you wanted to know a little bit more about convicts in 1843 or any year, you can put it in as a keyword and up it comes. So some examples to show what I mean. Um, here are the um, female prisoners who obtained tickets of leave in 1843. These will give you in the Government Gazette what area that the person was in. So if they were in Parramatta, you might um, find them listed here. You might find them in the official convict records, but then maybe you know, the writing's not good enough. And so this might be a clue if you haven't found them in the original records. It's also useful because it will put aliases. And I've put two arrows in here so that you can focus on uh, Catherine Lyons in the um, left-hand example. She's alias Eustace. And Freeman Mary, Mary Freeman, is also known as Jane McKilvia. So that's a totally different name. And the, um, the word or words after their name is the name of the ship that they came out on. Okay, so if you haven't been able to identify that, you will then know that um, Mary Freeman came out on the Rosalind Castle and Catherine Lyons came out on the George Hibbert. So the word or words at the end is the name of the ship. And that just made the information missing from an official record and it can be a clue also where they're living at the time of the ticket of leave. I also like to know more about what my convicts are doing, where they're living, and also what they're eating. And this is just an 1843 list. These convicts that were still there were on the government rations list. That meant the government still had to provide food and that sort of thing for them during their um, time before they um, sentence was up. So you can sort of see um, male convicts were given 12 ounces of wheaten bread, 14 ounces of maize or barley bread. They have got brown sugar, salt, yellow soap. The female convicts, there were different classes depending on what kind of work they were doing and that then depended on what kind of rations they got. Children two years and old were also um, listed in these rations and obviously not convicts but the children of convicts but they had to be supported because their um, mother usually um, was still on the convict um, convict list and children under two years you find um, even they get a quarter ounce of yellow soap and under nine months it's really quite detailed and um, one of the things I found interesting was that the, um, the military, they were entitled to an imperial court of rum. 
and when I went through some of the um, the conditions of the provision of these um, foodstuffs, uh, right down the end it said the rum shall be West India, five percent under proof. And you can see if you read this later, um, it talks about whether the beef is going to be beef or mutton and that type of thing. It's a good insight into what our convict ancestors might have been given to make their um, food supplies while on the convict list. Now, this is a book um, by William Derricourt in 1899. It's essentially his life as a convict. And I've, what I've done there, and it's in my heritage, um, you can see it in the publication section in the published sources. What he's done is done various parts outlining his whole life. So part one, he's called Dark England. And this is his early days, all the things he got into. And then of course, part two is the land of the lash. He's now a convict. He's been sent to Hobart Town. Part three, he's an assigned servant. So he's gone from being just in the general pool. He's an assigned servant and he's on his way to becoming free. Part four, he's a free bushman. And he goes on about how he's um, living that free life. And he moves to the gold fields. And that's the Victorian gold fields. And of course, once you get into the gold fields, you'll find bush rangers, robbery, all that sort of thing. And um, I've left you with chapter one, The Curse of Drink in Robbery Under Arms. It's a really good read. There's about 367 images. But if you wanted to have an, a first-hand account of how someone saw their life from convict or pre-convict through to the end of their life, and there's an, quite a few more parts in his story, it's a real good read and you can find it on my heritage. Just for something different, this caught my eye um, during the week because it's a new collection on my heritage and it's the Victorian Will and Probate Index 1850 to 2009. That's quite recent and it's a really good index to find uh, things like death dates and probate dates. It doesn't lead you to the digitised images, which only go up to 1925 anyway, but you have um, the index all the way through to 2009. Um, I put in my Henry Bullen, who was in Victoria um, for the gold fields in the 1850s. He died in 1875. And you'll see his wife, where I've got the arrow, is Anna Bullen. Her name was Georgiana. You have to look for variants in these records because I was looking for Georgiana everywhere and she had shortened her name and was calling herself Anna. So think about those variants. They can really stop you from finding someone. So Henry is in the My Heritage Index and this is basically what it tells you. His date of death, his an occupation is a carter. They were at Sebastopol. The grant of probate was 1876. So it's about six months after the date of death. Now, if you pop over to Public Record Office Victoria, they do have from the beginning up to 1925 digitized wills online and it is free. The trick with Victorian probates is there's usually more than one file. And uh, some files I've seen, there's five or six pieces of the file. So don't just find one digitized item and think you've got it all. It may be that you just have to search around a bit and there might be two or more. So in Henry's case, there are two files. And I can just click on the digitized item icon um, on the right hand side and it will bring up those two files um, for me to look at. Some of the files are 
extremely good. This is the deposition um, that Anna Bullen signed, and she's basically saying at this point, Henry Bullen was deceased, I'm his widow, there are six children, and she goes on to give their names and ages. That can be useful if you've had trouble trying to find um, the names of children because um, civil registration in Australia, well, it started at various times in places like New South Wales and Victoria, it didn't start till 1856. So you need to um, sometimes use probates to get names of children and that who may have been born before 1856. Now, moving on to another one of my favourite um, background context type of records, and that's the cyclopedias. All of the um, colonies did these cyclopedias towards the end of the century, and certainly in the early 1900s, most of them were published. They can be one or more volumes, and you can search for names, and some names are in them, but I mostly use keywords. I'll look for a place um, or an occupation or something in that um, sort of idea rather than a person. And what I mean by that is if my people in South Australia were at Moonta, which is a copper mine, when I put that into the My Heritage database, it brings back 127 references to Moonta and I can go through those and get background information on what it was like as a mining place before it um, sort of slowed down and people went elsewhere. So you can see some of the examples. Um, you can scroll down. It's a bit like the newspapers. It might interest you, it might not, but you can see the full record there. The Cyclopedia of South Australia I've just given you the contents of volume one here. A lot of these early digital um, public, digitized publications now will show you things like the um, kangaroo and the emu. They were all on our publications. But if you look behind the contents banner there, you'll see that the grade area includes the Northern Territory and South Australia. The Australian borders changed over time. You need to be aware of that. So if you had someone in the Northern Territory um, when it was part of South Australia, you'd be looking in South Australia for the records. So be aware of border changes. And if you have a look at the contents in any of these cyclopedias, um, there's lots of information. There's statistical information, there's biographies, information on the government, and um, businesses, places, all kinds of information. This is just taking um, the contents list down a little more. If you had people in early Adelaide, for example, it splits up the suburban districts where I've got the arrow. You can see the development of some of these early places in Adelaide, or you can have a look at a country town or a particular um, area like the Outer Harbour and that sort of thing, or naval forces in South Australia. Each state had its own navy at that point in time. So contents are definitely worth browsing. And then, of course, once you find something of interest and you go in and have a look, you may even be rewarded with these little biographical sketches, um, photographs of some of the more well-known people or just business people. They don't have to be um, sort of politicians or anything. They can just be well-known people in their particular community. And that may be the only photo that you, you find of someone. And the other thing to look for is photographs of businesses. If you know your person was um, had a store or something like that, you can um, look at the images and while well, this is a photograph of Mr. Chandler's premises, Jay Madden's cash draper is next door. And you may be lucky that the one that it's highlighting is Chandler's, but Madden is next door and that might be what you're looking for. So think about the photographs in these 
um, publications as well as the text. If you have um, ancestors who end up in hospital, jail, in the what was then called the lunatic asylum and other asylums, you can find out the history of these sorts of um, institutions in the cyclopedias. So if we look at this, um, the first um, establishment was in 1846. Before that, they probably were just um, admitted into jail because there was no other place for them. And then it goes on and tells you that it um, moved from here to there and so on. So sometimes, um, I mean, my Henry Bullitt, he ended up in an asylum in Victoria and it wasn't because he had mental illness. It was just that he became um, quite senile and um, his wife couldn't look after him anymore and he went into an asylum and those records exist and you can get lots of information. So think about institutions like jails, hospitals and asylums. This is um, the uh, Parkside Asylum in Adelaide and it's, they're very, very like prisons in a way. If you look at the buildings, um, they're designed to, you know, help, you know, dozens and dozens of people, but they're, they're very much like a prison. And you will find that there may be some records for the staff. In this particular instance, I've just put a, a snippet there for some of the head staff at this particular asylum. All dying histories, they're very similar to the cyclopedias. And the example I've got here is New South Wales. So depending on what state colony that you're researching, have a look for these published resources. Again, you've got the same type of thing. You will find that there are many biographies of people. The example here is a wheelwright, wagon maker, and general blacksmith. And, you know, you wouldn't think perhaps that the blacksmith would make this publication, but he might have been well known in the area. And it's incredible information you may not find elsewhere. He's from Yorkshire. He's born in 1825. He learned his trade there. He went to London, came to Sydney in 1850, spent time in Newtown, Wollongong, Mittagong, and finally settled in Goulburn. That's the sort of information that you might not find about his travels in between his birth and his death. And the entry underneath is for a sawmill, joinery and moulding works. And so businesses could also have these little histories because their um, founding person was notable in the um, community. Now, I'm going to skip over the channel or the ditch, as we call it, and just talk about New Zealand for a moment. And that's because Australia and New Zealand have a long long history of jumping over the ditch. We crossed the Tasman many, many times, often as miners, the gold rushes in each country would attract people, but people um, intermarried with New Zealanders and came back and so on. So I'm going to refer to the Cyclopedia of New Zealand. It has six volumes divided up into the basic um, New Zealand provinces, Wellington, Auckland, Canterbury, Otago and Southland, Nelson, Marlborough and Westland, and Taranaki, Hawke's Bay. Now, they were all published in the early 1900s, late 1890s. If you go into this particular publication, and I've just picked volume two, Auckland, because I happen to know there's an awful lot of Tasmanian convicts buried in Auckland Cemetery. People started their new life in New Zealand. They could start fresh and leave their convict history behind. So I've just picked Auckland on a random note. And instead of looking for people, um, I'm just going to put in Australia as a keyword. 
and you can see with the arrow, I've just used Australia as a keyword. I could put Queensland or Victoria or whatever I was looking for. But what this found for me was a number of people who had arrived in Australia and ended up in New Zealand. So if you thought they were always in New Zealand and couldn't find their shipping, it may be because they first arrived in Australia and there's no record of that apart from the fact that they then lived their life in New Zealand. And of course, it could be vice versa. They arrive in New Zealand and end up in Australia. So we'll just take a look at some of these examples. Um, John Arnold, top left, um, born in Lancashire, came out to Australia in 1852. So many people came to Victoria largely in the 1850s, and that was because of the gold. And then, of course, the New Zealand gold fields started. You've got the Otago, the Waikato, and people jumped across and went into those gold fields. Now, some stayed in New Zealand and some came back. John Hartley, he arrived in New Zealand in 1852, and this actually gives the name of the ship, which is useful if you can't find him elsewhere. And it then tells you he went to Queensland and he was there gold mining. Then he went to New South Wales and other parts of Australia. He returned to New Zealand and spent a couple of years here and there before he finally settled down. Those sorts of travels you just can't pick up just um, with birth, death and marriage certificates and that sort of thing. And the final example is someone from County Antrim in Ireland. He landed in Victoria, 1851, came to New Zealand 12 years later. And that may be the clue that you can try and find, you know, maybe the ship he went from Australia to New Zealand. But a lot of times that is just so many people um, on a coastal um, passenger list from Victoria and it doesn't give you any information and you can't identify your people. And even if it is mentioned in newspapers, quite often it'll just be an initial and a surname and often there's no record at all. But this sort of thing will maybe help you to explain why you can't find a passenger list in either Australia or New Zealand. The Australian Handbook 1904 I focused a little bit around the 1900 mark because Australia came into being in 1901. That's when the colonies federated to become a country, but they continued to have their own separate systems except for functions that were more central like military and telecommunications and that sort of thing. So with the handbook of 1904, this was all about attracting people out to Australia. And the keyword or place that I've used in this example is Queensland. And it brings up in the contents page all kinds of things. I particularly like the historical calendars. They show all kinds of odd things. This one even had a Mohammedan calendar, and that's 1904. So it's interesting what you can find. You've got clubs in London or the cab fairs in London. This is an Australian handbook, but it has interesting things in it that you could spend hours reading this sort of thing. But here's the calendar and why I like looking at calendars. You'll get things like um, the Australian Anti-Transportation League inaugurated in 1851. The price of the Brisbane Courier was reduced to £1 in 1893, and that's because of the 1890s depression. That was bigger than the 1930s depression. But people don't often realise that because it's outside of living memory. But it's an indication that the 1890s was very big indeed. Um, bushfires in Victoria, something that we still suffer from. But if you've got Victorians, you might want to check out where were the fires in that particular year. Um, it tells you all kinds of people who died during a particular 
um, period. And things like Maryborough, Queensland, founded 1851. So it allows you to sort of build up this picture of what's going on in Australia. Continuing down, um, this is February, by the way, and it was a leap year, uh, which is why there's 29 days there. Um, I was fascinated by Madame Albani arrived in Sydney in 1898. I'd never heard of her. And that's the beauty of these types of publications. They make you want to go and look further. Uh, the Great Floods in Hobart, 1854. You can go to the newspapers, have a look. What, how, how bad were the Great Floods of 1854? But coming back to Madame Albani, she was a Canadian uh, opera soprano, and she toured Europe and um, North America, and she also did a tour um, down under, and people went along and saw her. And so it's that sort of thing that we often think in Australia, well, maybe we didn't have too much culture in those early years, but we did have visiting opera sopranos coming, and people did go along. And, and listen to them. So it's interesting to think, what did our ancestors do for culture? Um, within the handbook, you can go to the different um, colonies and states as they became, and this is Victoria. So you can see um, all the different types of categories. Um, you've got clubs in Melbourne, charitable and beneficial benevolent institutions, that's your asylums. You can find out um, how much it costs to do cables back or where were the lighthouses or loans to farmers and um, all kinds of things, neglected children and reformatory schools. These are things that you can find out if you need to, to give your family history background context. And one of the interesting things I picked up in this publication was that there were French mail steamers to Australia. If someone had said, oh, the French were coming out here in their own ships, I probably would have said, oh, I'm not too sure about that. But there was a French company who was um, bringing people out to Australia and they had four ships or four steamers, I should say. And it gives you a their passage, first class, 76 pounds, second class, 48, and so on. And I thought, well, who would get on a French mail steamer? Because Australians would have only been speaking English at that point in time. But if you go into the French steam company, um, they go to great lengths to explain that they have English stewards who are on all of the steamers and that it's very much a English type experience. And you can see on the left that um, first class was entitled to table wines, sherry, masala, English ales and stout and cognac, um, beer and claret to second class and only claret to third class. It's again, something that if you can work out what class your family came out as, you get an idea of what kind of cabin they may have had, what kind of food they ate, and that type of thing. Um, so we did have French mail steamers coming out, and people did arrive on those. Now, just a little bit of a recap. The Australia Collection Catalogue is in Oceania. If you select Australia, you can refine that further and you can see um, that there are um, six colonies, states there that you can then further go down. I, I'd suggest you explore some of these categories, particularly the published resources and those sorts of things. Um, you just might be surprised what you're going to find. So in conclusion, the, a lot of this material is excellent background context. All those encyclopedias and handbooks, they can help explain why people moved around. I haven't covered birth, death, marriage, burials, tombstones, and um, other probates 
in today's talk or newspapers, which also give insight into people in the community. But if you're tracing people, don't forget your directories and electoral rolls. And good luck. And I'll stop sharing at this point. Thank you, Shauna. That was very, very informative. Um, I, okay. I took down your slides now um, and we'll take a few questions. But uh, before we take the questions, I just want to add that uh, Shauna's first lecture, which was the basis um, that this lecture is based on, you can watch it um, as well as all of our other Facebook Lives on my, um, the My Heritage Facebook page. So that's facebook.com slash myheritage under the videos section. So there you can see Shauna's first lecture as well as all of our other Facebook Lives. So if you want to uh, rewatch this one um, and watch that one first, please feel free to do so. They are all, they are all there. Um, Shauna, we have a couple short questions, if that's OK. Yes, um, that's fine. Yep. So the first one we have uh, is um, from Di, and she says, I am looking for someone in Queensland, but I'm not having much success. I'm hoping electoral record will be accessible, will help if accessible. Any suggestions uh, for me? Um, well, it's, it depends on what the surname is. I mean, if it's a very common surname, you really need to know what is their occupation because then you could focus on occupation um, directories. There's um, directories like cattle brands and um, animal animal horse brands and things like that. So um, it's a matter of um, focusing on your surname and getting it as exact as you can, but keep all your variants and look at what details you need to know where they are in Queensland um, that's that's the other thing that Queensland is a huge place and um, even the Supreme Court there's three different areas there's the southern court the central court out from Rockhampton and the northern court out from Townsville so if you're looking for a probate um, and you're only searching in the south and they died in the north you're looking in the wrong place. So whenever you're searching for someone in Queensland, you really need to know where were they um, and what, what did they do? And then look at what records might help you with that. And of course, if you can get some birth, death and marriage records that pin them down, uh, that helps too. Okay, fantastic. Um, Lorna asks, is there a record of the people who were transported to Australia and the area during the potato famine in the British Isles? Um, that's, that's a mixed question um, because, yes, some Irish convicts did come out and you would look for them um, in convict records. But a lot of the um, Irish, um, particularly from Western western side of Ireland also came out as immigrants and they might have come out um, in, as steerage passengers or or under government schemes and that would be largely in the 1840s so you're probably looking New South Wales at that time because Victoria really didn't get going until the 1850s um, Tasmania was more convict so a little bit of Australian history helps too to determine where people might have gone. So with the Irish um, in the 1840s, yes, I'd look in Irish convict records, which are at the National Archives in Ireland, but also we've got convict records here and in New South Wales and immigration records in New South Wales as well. And I know a lot of Irish came out to Queensland in the 1860s, which is a you know, a little bit later, um, but Queensland opened up, well, was established in 1859, and then they tried to attract immigrants, and they got a lot of Irish immigrants in the 60s. Wow, um, I know I'm learning a lot about 
Australian family history that I didn't know before. Um, we have this comment here from Anya, very nice. She says, thank you, Shauna. Um, it's an inspiration and information to continue the searches outside the box. So thank you for, for helping her and for helping all of us uh, with a lot of this information. Uh, I know that uh, this was definitely uh, a step a step further from the first session. So, so really incredible. Um, and we have we have a comment from uh, Rhoda who said, "Great presentation. Will Shauna be having a regular segment?" <laughs> so, oh, there's, there's only so much I can talk about. <laughs> We'll definitely have to be in have to be in touch uh, about about another time, perhaps. And um, we'll now we'll give away the the winning subscription to one lucky winner. It's a My Heritage Complete Plan, which will give one lucky winner free access to all the records that Shauna spoke about. 12.5 billion historical records on My Heritage, unlimited family tree size, and much much more. And the winner of today's uh, session is Megan McPherson. And Megan wrote, I recently learned that I had some ancestors from Australia. I had no idea. And my heritage has opened a whole set of records, almost like an early Christmas present for me. If it wasn't for my heritage and all the wonderful records uh, and newspapers and censors, census records, um, I would I wouldn't have found it and she says keep up the Facebook lives I love the sessions so thank you Megan and congratulations we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize um, and for anyone who wants to rewatch today's session or any of the previous ones just a reminder go to the my heritage Facebook page facebook.com slash my heritage under videos and you'll be able to see all the different sessions. Shauna, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed thinking out of, outside of the box and sharing it. Thank fantastic, you. fantastic. And no matter where you're located today, uh, have a great day, have a great night, have a great morning, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.